Hello everyone out there. I'm pumped to be here with you today for chapter seven, which we're going to get to in a moment. It's, a, it's an intense one. Uh, but before then, we got to do the review of chapter six. So in chapter six, what had happened is, you know, if you remember, Hector ended up battling Ajax, this tough, tough Greek bat warrior in single combat. So they fought each other one on one. But after they both kind of got knocked down, up, they both agreed to hold off on friendly terms until the next day. They actually gave each other gifts, too. Um, the next day, the Greeks got really whooped pretty badly. They got driven back basically to their ships. Um, so at this point in the story, or in the battle or war, they seem to be losing. However, even that, even though that was occurring, Diomedes and a few other strong warriors were like, no, we're going to keep fighting. So they didn't want to run away. Um, Agamemnon agreed to keep fighting and he he's like, well, we'll probably need Achilles. So he promises to make things better with Achilles and actually say sorry and give him a bunch of gifts. But Achilles, even though his friends are trying to convince him, he's stubborn and he will not give in. So he says, I'm not fighting. So that's actually where we left off. Now, what's interesting here, we're going to get into a chapter called The Horses of King Rhesus. Now, I just want to put a warning out there. It is intense. At least one part of it is intense and it's a little bit violent intense. So if you're sensitive to, you know, blood or death, then I'm just putting a warning out there. Okay, so let's hop into it, though. Here's the cover. There was little enough sleep for any of the Greek leaders that night, none at all for Agamemnon. Too restless to stay within his own hall, he flung the lion-skin rug from his bed about his shoulders and went out, thinking to seek out wise old Nestor. But Menelaus also was awake and restless. He was, they both were like, oh, no, I can't get to bed, I can't get to sleep. And only a little way beyond the ships, the two of them chanced upon each other and stood together for a while, gazing across the plain to the watch fires of the Trojan war host. So you can imagine them looking out and seeing all these fires of the Trojan camp where they're still stayed in there and they had just kind of beat them back that day. A fine thing it would be, Menelaus said at last, if one of our young men lacking sleep like ourselves were to make his secret way over to the Trojan camp and listen to the talk around those fires and bring us word of what to expect when dawn comes and the fighting light returns. The high king was much struck with this. A fine thing indeed, and we will bring it about, my brother. But first we must put it to the council. So he likes it, but I got to get a group of smart men to come together and decide, should we do this? Should we send somebody over to the Trojan camp to basically see what's going on over there and give us word? So they went and roused or woke up old Nestor and the other chiefs who did not wait to put on their armor, but flung about them the skin rugs from their beds and came just as they were. So you can imagine back then, they're kind of out living on the plains in nature. So their beds, it's like a rug made out of animal skin and they're just, they throw it on and they just walk on outside. First, they visited the young warriors guarding the ship wall to be sure that they also were wakeful. And then they crossed the ditch and set themselves down where they had a clear view of the Trojan watchfires to discuss the plan. No picture on the next pages. Nectar said, Nestor said, let one of the young men go out in the darkness into the Trojan camp and either seek to capture for us a straggler whom we can question or overhear the talk about the Trojan watchfires. So we may learn whether they mean to remain in the open and maybe attack us at our camp at dawn or go back again within their walls now that it must seem to them that they have worsted us. So they're gonna come back and fight even more? Or are they going home like, hey, we already beat these, these Greeks, they're done. Diomedes was on his feet almost before the old king had finished speaking. That is a task for two men rather than one. I will go if I may take another of my own choosing with me. Choose then, said the kings and captains, and he chose Odysseus. Odysseus got more slowly to his feet. Better be on our way, for the night is more than half gone. So Diomedes and Odysseus are going to go out and do this adventure. They borrowed weapons from the young men of the guard and leather helmets which would not catch the firelight as bronze would do, having hurried to answer the high king's summons unarmed. So they're going, no, nothing to, like, they're not going to go and fight these people. They're going to just look with their eyes and ear and listen with their ears. And they set out, prowling like a pair of hunting lions through the darkness and the scattered bodies of the dead. 
At the very same time, in the Trojan camp, Hector had gathered together his own captains and called for a man to enter the Greek camp and find out if the Greeks, the Greeks kept their usual watch, or if they were too weary and so might be taken sleeping by a dawn attack. And to any man who would go out and bring back word of this, he promised the two best horses in the enemy camp. So he's like, hey, maybe if those Greeks over there are sleeping and we know that, we can go over there and kill them all when they're sleeping and really win this thing. And I'll promise two horses, the best, to whoever goes over and, and checks it out for us. Now among the Trojans, there was a young man called Dolan, ugly and rather foolish, but very swift of foot, so he's fast who cared for horses more than for anything else in the whole world. And he spoke up. Oh, great Hector, give me the chariot horses of Achilles, and, and I will pierce right through the Greek camp to the hull of Agamemnon himself and bring you back the word that you seek. And he took his bow and flung a gray wolfskin over his shoulder and set out, running low for the camp along the shore. But Diomedes and Odysseus, on their own hunting trail, saw him coming, and guessed his purpose, and lay down among the dead of yesterday's fighting until he was well past them. So they pretended to be dead. They're like... Then they sprang up and went out after him like hunting dogs after a hare, like a rabbit. Dolan heard their feet behind him and lengthened his stride, but he could not pull away from them, nor swing back to his own people, for the two men were too close behind. So they ran him down just before he came up to the ship wall and brought him to a stand, his teeth chattering in his head with fear as they grasped his arms. <laughs> he broke into tears, begging them not to kill him, for he was the son of a rich man who would ransom him with much gold. So if you, if you call my father, he'll give you a lot of money for me. Before we talk of ransom... Tell us what you are doing here so far from your own camp and so close to ours, Odysseus said. And Dolan told how Hector had promised him the chariot horses of Achilles for spying on the Greeks. Ha, ah, you aim high, Odysseus said, smiling in the dark. The horses of Achilles are not mortal breed, and none may drive them save Achilles himself or the man he bids or allows to drive them. But nonetheless, it is well that we meet here. For now you shall tell us, do the Trojans plan to camp out here on the open plain to attack us at dawn, so in the morning, or to draw back within their walls, now that seemingly they have had the better of the fighting? And how are the Trojan guard posts yet? And where does Hector sleep this night, and where are his horses? For the thought came to him, his grandfather had been a famous thief, and the gift had come down to him that it would be a thing worth the doing to steal the best horses in the Trojan war host. Hoping to save his neck, Dolan grabbled forth all that Odysseus asked, that Hector was not sleeping but with the council, that the Trojans kept their watches unsleeping, having their own people in the city to think of, but that their allies, their friends from other lands, far off lands, their wives and children being safe at home, were not so careful. That whether or not there was a dawn or morning attack depended on the word that he, Dolan, brought back for, from his spying. But, but if, it is, if it is horses that you want, said he, the, the best and most noble in all the camp are those of, of Rhesus, king of the Thracians, who, who came in to join us only this day. They lie at the eastern end of the camp. Here's some pictures of what maybe are those horses. Big horses, wind swift and white as swans, and with them his chariot decked with gold and silver, fit for the gods. Then he fell again to weeping and praying for his life. But Diomedes said, That you may escape and return to spy on us again? And he struck Dolan cleanly with his sword, so that his head fell from his shoulders while he was still pleading. So much for our straggler, Odysseus said. Next, for the Thracian king's horses. Quickly they covered the spy's body with reeds and young tamarisk branches, and, taking his bow and his martin skin cap, 
I don't even know what Martin's skin is, but it, maybe it's some animal skin hat that he's wearing. He, they set them in high in the nearby tamarisk bush to mark the spot that they might not miss it on their way back. And they went on through the night. They came to the Thra Thracian camp and found no watch set and the warriors all sleeping deeply. King Rhesus in their midst besides his chariot with the 12 hearth companions of his bodyguard all about him. So they're all just there sleeping with these beautiful horses next to them. Diomedes slew or killed the king and his 12 companions swiftly and in silence, making no sound to rouse the rest or awake the rest of the camp. And Odysseus dragged the dead men aside to make a clear path that the king's horses, which had maybe never been in battle before, might not be frightened at being led out over the bodies of the slain. Can you see the bodies in that picture as they're walking by? Yikes. Then they freed the straps by which the horses were tethered to the ivory chariot rail. They did not wait to take the chariot itself, splendid though it was, for night was wearing on towards dawn and already the rest of the camp was stirring or becoming awake. But leaping upon the horses' broad white backs, they urged them out, past the Thracians, dead or half-roused or still sleeping, and headed back for the ship wall in their own camp, checking to gather up the weapons and the marten skin cap of the wretched Dolan on the way. Great was the welcome they received from the kings and leaders, and great the rejoicing or celebrating at the tale they had to tell. For, with King Rhesus dead, it was sure that the Thracians would now go home, and so thousands of fresh warriors would be lost to the Trojans' war host. So when the king is killed, a lot of the people that would normally follow that king, and here it might be thousands of fighters, they're just like, wow, if they killed our king, we're going home, right? Then Diomedes picketed the horses beside his own and gave them a feed of the same honeyed wheat, while Odysseus stowed the bloody cap and weapons in the stern of his ship, ready to be dedicated to Athena. So he's going to give those as gifts or sacrifices to Athena. And when that was done, the two champions waded into the sea and bathed off the blood and the thick sweat of that night's work from their arms and necks and thighs. Then they scrubbed themselves in tubs of water made hot for them by the slaves until they felt themselves clean once more and went to claim their share of the morning food and wine for by that time, dawn was well up in the sky. Okay, so that is it actually for that chapter. Uh, interesting times, huh? I mean, and I, I told you, I was warning you about the violence there. It was, it's pretty intense. So let me pull up for myself uh, the question. I only want to ask you one question today and then do a face. So the question it's, it is, so it definitely seemed pretty brutal or bad seemingly of Diomedes to like whoosh and chop off Dolan's head like that. I mean, he killed him right on the spot. But why do you think Diomedes did this? Like, why did he not allow Dolan to live? Like there was something said in the chapter, but I'm curious if you, if you heard it or if you think of it outside of the chapter. Okay. And then the face I want, and this is an interesting one. This is Dolan right before He's about to be killed. He doesn't know he's going to be killed, but he's like crying for his life. So what does that face look like? Okay, this is going to mine and then you do yours. Okay, that's real exaggerated, but you know, who knows? So rock that face, see what it's like. And then I will see you next time for the chapter, it's chapter eight. It's called Red Rain. Now, Red Rain. Rain. I mean, rain is falling from the skies and red, we typically think of, at least in this case, blood. So maybe it's going to be serious. All right. Talk soon, guys. Adios.